Hello and welcome back to week two of FTV 3017M Heroes and Villains. Uh, as you may be able to tell already, uh, I'm Andrew Elliott again, and this is the second week of your uh, lectures of the introductory lectures that talk about the brand, the broader themes and the grand themes. So this week we're going to be talking about genre films. In particular, we'll be thinking about the quest motif and the way that the quest motif plays out through a series of um, films, a series of genre films, and in particular we'll be focusing on the Western and the ways in which it relates to the, this week's set film, Platoon, from 1986. So, um, we're going to be trying to integrate more film clips than I did last time. Um, we, as most of your lectures probably are doing, uh, we're trying out new software, so I hope it'll all work. Um, and in this lecture, we're going to start off by looking at... Uh, first of all, the uh, question of genre. So we'll do the, the definitions. So I'll show you uh, the slides here. The overview we're looking at, first of all, uh, we're going to start off by looking at genre in itself uh, and asking what do we mean by genre. Um, then we're going to move on to look at the case study of westerns and in particular uh, the, the westerns made by John Ford starring John Wayne. Uh, so I'll be going through the way that the quest motif actually plays out and defines in some senses the westerns in particular telling the story of uh america and how america views itself through how it, it it believes itself to have come to be and then we'll finish by looking at the social context in which genre films play out of why genres exist how they exist as part of the social context and what that kind of that reading of the films might mean um, for the social context. Once again, um, it's worth reminding ourselves of why we're doing this, why we're looking at it in this way, and that is because of the the entire point of the of this module is to look at the the relationship between the cultures that are making films and the films that represent. Uh, those cultural values held dear to each one. So my argument has been, as with last week, when we look at a specific kind of film, we are able to read that film in a certain way, sometimes against the grain, in order to read back into it the heroic values and, and principles that underpin it. So when we're looking at a genre film, what we find instantly is we come up against a tension because a genre film, as we're about to discover, is a film which, as part of what it means really uh, is a film which um, which is defined by certain rhythms certain patterns certain motifs and so on and what we'll see is a tension between that and the idea that a a, fil a given film can read a specific kind of moment of historical uh, materialism backwards uh, means we come into conflict with the idea that first of all I'm saying there's a motif and a pattern and secondly I'm saying that each one will vary according to the specific motif so a uh, specific context so we'll, that's what we'll be plowing into uh, over the course of this lecture um, so let's start off by thinking about what it is that we mean by a genre film so uh, let's take subject and subjects definition from an int introduction to film um, they call a genre a film which belongs to a particular group of films that are extremely similar in their subject matter, thematic concerns, characterizations, plot formulas, and visual settings. Such a film somehow, and they don't specify how, but some, such a film somehow depends on these similarities for its very existence and for the satisfactions it brings to the viewer. Now, I'm not going to um, leave these slides up for as long as I would in a lecture theatre because I'm going to assume that at any point you can pause and write down any um, any slides. Um, but it's worth thinking through precisely what the key terms here are. So if we, if we read that subject and subject definition again, what we realise is there are some key terms coming out quite early. Um, in particular, uh, they are the, the idea that it's a group of films, one, that are extremely similar two in the subject matter that they express thematic concerns three characterizations plot formulas and visual settings all of those are three such a film somehow depends on its these similarities for its very existence and for the satisfactions four it brings to the viewer five now it's worth bearing those in mind for a second as we go through to the next point which is genre cycles because of course i'm sure most of you have studied this at some point before if you think about it, is something weird is taking place. How is it possible? Uh, how is it possible that a film is following a genre and belongs to an identifiable genre, and that identifiable genre has specific rules, and those rules are, as subject and subject say, quite limited. 
then how is it possible for them to be a different film to emerge? Why is it not the case that all genre films are the same? And it might be really easy to say I like to flippantly mock uh, and wind you guys up by saying that superhero films are the same. They're actually not. And even the biggest... Uh, even the biggest critic of a superhero film would have to admit and acknowledge that each film is doing something different and appealing to a different character. And they're clearly patently not the same film over and over again. But at the same time, subject and subject's definition says that they must exist as following that motif. So we'll come on to that in a moment, how we reconcile it. But we also can bring into to play Christian Metz's really important um, argument about genre cycles, which is that genre cycles exist. Right, uh, the that he suggests that they exist in cycles. Right, so rather than there being a genre which is static over time, these genres go through little tweaks and little modifications over and over again, so that they begin with a classic. So if we take the Western, for instance, we can see that the classic iteration of the genre, which contains all the rules and all of the things that you might expect to see, appears in Shane, for instance. Uh, the next level would be the self-conscious parody. So we might think about something like The Shootist, which is a film, uh, if, you, if you know it, you'll know what I mean. It's a film that's deliberately, it's not a parody in the sense it mocks it or undermines it particularly, but it uses some of those tropes and it might draw attention to the fact that these are tropes and that these are expected. So they might have lines in them where they say, you know, I thought you were going to do this, as in, we expect you to do that. Then you might come to something that uh, Metz calls the denial of genre, uh, which occurs in something like The Wild Bunch, uh, the Sam Peckinpah 1979 film, uh, 1979 film um, in which he's following a genre pattern. He's clearly identifying his, his film as part of the Western, but he's also refusing some of the key ca ele elements and tenets of that genre. And I'm trying not to sort of spoil these films for you. Uh, in order to... Um, in order to draw into it, uh, to draw attention to the fact that the the genre has limits, and you can think about this maybe in in terms of um, the limits on a map or something. So if you uh, if you want a kind of an analogy for that, then you might think um, you could be born. If you imagine you were born into some kind of huge city that was just felt when you were a child, it feels endless, and anyone who's grown up in a big city might recognise this feeling. It feels like the city goes on and on and on and on and on, and then there is no countryside. Um, but then when you reach the edge of the city, that's when you realise that the city is contained and that the city is finite, and therefore you start to realise what the city is because you're seeing what the city isn't. Um, and so that denial of the genre works in the same way, that the expression and pushing to the very edges of a genre actually reveals the extent, uh, reveals the rules of the genre in the first place. And then the fourth is, uh, that Metz identifies, is the critique of the genre itself. And we could point to a film very clearly like Unforgiven, um, Clint Eastwood's 1991 or 92 film, Unforgiven, in which um, we find someone who's become very famous through the Western genre, of course, through the Sergio Leone Spaghetti Westerns, which are another kind of question about genre cycles. We might call them kind of a self-conscious parody. Um, but we see in Clint Eastwood directing and starring in a film which both rejects the earlier rules of the genre and draws attention to the genre in itself. So it's a critique of the genre in itself. Um, and this is really important because... Uh, it's worth mentioning here actually also that Christian Metz never really writes these so clearly in these kind of four parts even though you've probably come across them if you studied a level film you'll almost certainly have come across a textbook that includes these four rules uh, but when you actually come to cite them in an essay it's much more difficult but there I've extrapolated them from 1975 language and cinema you can see at the bottom there the the reference uh, and so uh, don't quote these uh, slides but you need to go to the original text if you want to use the idea of cycles um, they thus become cycles, not genres in themselves. And so how do we reconcile that? Baldwell and Thompson in their classic film Art and Introduction reconciled it very capably by recognising that what, as they say, a genre never dies, it may fast pass out of fashion for a time only to return in updated garb. And that leads us to an interesting point, is what would make a... Uh, sorry, that's me, uh, my mouse there moving around. Uh, which brings us to an interesting point, which is what would make a genre fall out of fashion and what would make it come back and that is precisely where the kind of the key uh, exists right if we think that a genre exists a genre exists and goes through cycles and then falls out of fashion and then disappears for 
10, 15, 20 years, as we saw with the epic film. We see that 1965 is the kind of the pinnacle of the film. The epic film, it dies away with uh, the fall of the Roman Empire, and of appropriately, um, and it disappears. And then we don't see it again until 2001 with uh, Ridley Scott's Gladiator, and it's reborn again. And it seems to be pretty much on the way out, and it's kind of dying uh, once again as, a, as a, an ancient world kind of trope. So what makes them go away and what makes them come back? Um, part of that is inherent within the definition of genre in itself. Uh, if we think about the, the genre films, they're films that identify with one another. And they are, as Tom Ryle uh, argues, they are films that... Um, Sorry, they are films that are defined as uh, patterns, forms, styles and structures which transcend individual films and which supervise both their construction by the filmmaker and their reading by an audience. And there, there, in that little moment is where we find uh, the real imp interesting part of the genre and why they might go away and why they might come back is because it's something to do with the audience. It's something to do with these these patterns that transcend the individual films that create a kind of a, a package, like a bundle in some senses of films that are offered to the offered to the audience. They are only popular for as much or for as long as the audience wants them. And so in the same way as we can read the tastes of a generation through reading the fashions uh, as they come and go in cycles through sort of decades and decades and decades, and you would be able to go to a uh, fancy dress party and, and see someone dressed in disco and recognize this is a 1970s theme. So the same thing happens with film is that they, they are popular in as much as they are recognizable, but they're also popular in as much as an audience wants them, right? And if the audience doesn't want them, then they will pass out of fashion. That's where they kind of uh, come in and out and that's where the cycles come into being. Yeah. So what we see is already a third element that takes place within our definition. There is a third element, which is uh, the audience members themselves. So uh, this is something that Graham Turner recognizes perfectly well in his film as social practice. He says, um, it's important to understand that a genre is the product of at least three groups of forces, the industry and its production practices, that's number one, the audience, number two, and their expectations and competencies, and the text in its contribution to the genre as a whole. And that is the clue that we're going to need to unpick the uh, the case study of the Western that we're going to see today. We're going to see that there are three things taking place. One is the industry and its production practices. So the industry needs to be interested and invested in the Western in itself, right? So they need to recognize a market for these films. They need to recognize uh, a kind of a uh, key director. So in the case of John Ford, a uh, key actor, as in, in the case as we're going to see of John Wayne, and a key setting. And we'll see that in you know Monument Valley um, and Death Valley um in sort of new mexico uh, california um the second aspect so that's the industry the second aspect is the audience and their expectations and competencies and this is the really important part because every definition of genre that we've seen so far talks about familiar texts or texts that overlap or texts that uh, or tropes that kind of are woven between two different kind of um two films whatever now if you think about that we think it's the audience that's recognizing them. So it's like that old classic thing that, you know, people sitting in pubs when they're trying to be philosophical and super deep and they always go like, uh, you know, how do we know these things? How do I know the color that I'm seeing is the same as you're seeing? Like, this is all about uh, you know observation and that kind of nonsense, right? When they're trying to be super intellectual. But actually what we're seeing there is the recognition of the self as a controlling and organizing principle and that is what's happening with the audience is that the genre film is only a genre film if the audience is recognized as such and we see this with things like um some marvel films that don't do quite so well uh i'm, I'm thinking of uh, deadpool for instance is, a, is probably a good example of that uh, or maybe even scott pilgrim which a lot of people would reject as kind of a comic book graphic novel superhero film but actually, we reject it because what we're saying, when you're rejecting that, what you're actually saying is, I know that there are rules to this genre, and this specific film doesn't fit those rules. So every kind of rejection or every kind of opinion you might hold about a film is not actually valid in itself. And I think I've said enough, you've been taught by me enough to know that uh, my, my kind of key motif is that everyone's opinion is completely irrelevant and no one's opinion matters. And it's not your opinion that matters, it's you, what you're revealing there about the extent to which we understand intuitively and instinctively the rules of a given genre. So that's the one is the industry, the two is the, uh, the audience, 
and the third is the text in itself. And you can see in Turner's kind of iteration, you can see something quite fascinating, which is that the text in itself comes third to all of this. It's it's the industry in the first place, the audience in the second place, and then third comes the, uh, the actual text and what it means. And so when we're looking at genre films and their kind of expression through of a, of a particular cultural moment or a cultural context, what we're seeing is something absolutely fascinating, which is that the text becomes secondary and takes a step backwards. Because in some senses, it's offering a pleasure to the audience uh, in that what specifically happens in that film isn't quite as important as the fact that they are supposed to follow the rules of the genre. So what this means then is that we get these kind of codes and conventions that uh, that exist, and these codes and conventions are fundamental to um, to recognizing the genre film. And in fact, Steve Neal um, calls them the uh, calls them an agreed code between the filmmaker and the audience. Uh, this is in his 1980 book Genre. Um, now there are two Steve Neal books. One is 1980, and one is 2001. Uh, and I think I think actually the 1980 one is Stephen Neal. Uh, genre and then the 2001 is called Steve is, is by Steve Neal genre um, or it might be called genre in Hollywood the later one I would recommend that you go to 2001 version rather than the 1980 version uh, for the simple reason and I think Steve Neal might agree with me here that the first one I mean you would might be tempted to go for the first one if you see it in the library because it's much shorter uh, and the second one's much longer but uh, the first one is really densely written it's very theoretical whereas the second one is much more relaxed and actually um, it's much uh, much easier to read I would recommend so if we take what Neil's saying, though, it's an agreed code between the filmmaker and the audience. This is what some French filmmakers used to call a pacte de créance, a belief pact or a belief contract. What's happening with a genre film is that you are agreeing, or the, genre, the filmmaker is agreeing with you, that he or she will follow the rules of the genre. And you are agreeing with the filmmaker on the industry, I will give you the money in you know, uh, in return for this film, or the money that you've spent making this film, I will give you it back if you provide me with the kind of the right balance of excitement and following the rules. Um, so the conventions of a genre are therefore, as Edward Buscombe suggests, known and recognised by the audience, and in itself it's that recognition that is the pleasure. And so this places us in a really interesting position because what we get is the rules or the sorry the the definitions of genre in themselves are are dependent they're actually codependent. Now, if you cast your mind back to last week's lecture on Hero and Villain, we argue that the Hero and the Villain were codependent as well as this specific context in which they're created. And what we see is, is genre doing precisely the same thing. We have a set of rules that everyone is supposed to recognise, but actually the fun and fascination comes from the tension between the two. If you can hear some snoring in the background, I do apologise. That is my dog, who's uh, quite small, but snores in a really loud way, and I have quite a sensitive microphone. So uh, if if that uh, has a background of snoring, I do apologise. Um, but what we have here then is the genre film. In a rare moment for film theory, most critics are actually in agreement with what it is and what it does and what it's supposed to do. Um, but what we're actually finding is that the the tension between them is uh, is precisely where we're going to to investigate the the context and the meaning of that film. So let's move into the second part of this lecture, uh, which is the case study of the westerns um, in themselves. So uh, the western as a the, the the classic genre film is very well known, and I know it's kind of an outdated form. Uh, it's also a, a a genre of film that tends to get super racist super quickly. Um, so it's a really difficult one to analyze now because. Um, to say that you know you are a fan of The Searchers, for instance, as a classic genre, uh, Western film, is is very difficult because it is a deeply, deeply racist film, and it's not even possible just to say, oh, it's a product of its era, and you know everyone was racist then because they weren't, and it's not, and that's a cop out. Um, what's actually true is you can enjoy and and take the pleasure from the film following the rules of the genre and also telling you about the anxieties, uh, uh, cultural anxieties and social tensions of both the 1940s when the, the film was made and the kind of the 1830s, 18, uh, no, it'd be later, sorry, 1860s, 1870s when the film is actually set. This tension about fundamental questions of who 
who we are, which is what the US is asking itself. They're asking, where do we come from? Who are we? And asking when they're talking about kind of cowboys and Indians. And, and of course, as always, I'm going to be cowboys and Indians with my uh, bunny quotes, right? Uh, when we're talking about the Native Americans, they're asking questions very uneasily about who actually has the right to own this land, who has the right to talk about conquest and the myth of conquest of America is the myth of progress that they like to tell it, it themselves and so on. It's really, really complicated. The other reason that Westerns are complicated is because they exist as both a highbrow and a lowbrow genre, um, by which uh, I mean to say for most Anglo-Saxon critics, and this is the quotation by Alan Lavelle on the screen, uh, the Western is typical of most of the vices of the mass media. It is endlessly repetitive, utterly simple in form, and expresses naive attitudes. For French critics, the Western contains nearly all of the things they most admire in the American cinema. Its directness, its intelligence, its energy, and its formal concerns. And in fact, André Bazin, who's the, uh, uh, the very famous um, film critic, uh, from the 1960s, the one that uh, you will remember from the film theory module. He's the one that influences the uh, Cahiers du Cinéma and the, the, the Godard, the Romer and, and, and so on, uh, and Chabrol and, and René. Um, André Bazin calls the Western the American film par excellence, more so than uh, more so than the uh, film noir, which they were adoring at the time, or you know the kind of detective film. More so than the war film, it is the Western that is the most uniquely American film because it is, in many respects, a, a historical film. And historical films, uh, as I've argued elsewhere, tell us who we are and who we think we are and who we want to be, and so on. So as a kind of a, a, ten, uh, a highbrow and a lowbrow genre, uh, the Western is a really interesting one. Um, what's very clear, though, about the Western is it is instantly recognisable. It is deeply recognisable and it follows very, very clear kind of tropes. Now, why would it do that? Because it's so integral uh, to the cultural language of America and the, and the cultural history of America. It is, as Will Wright argues, uh, it is the uh, Western myth which has become part of the cultural language by which America understands itself. Um, so in his book, Will Wright, uh, this, the book is called Six Guns and Society. It's an absolutely tremendous book. He argues that Westerns represent these mass-produced versions of core mythic material, which was already in circulation. So if you remember Vladimir Propp's stuff from Formalism from last week, where you have, you know, the hero and the helper and so on and so forth, um, Will Wright actually takes uh, those Proppian kind of formal elements and measures them against the Western film. Um, and his results are, are really spectacular. He finds in dozens and dozens of these films that the the relationship between the cowboy as the six guns and the society in which he uh, he and uniquely it is he inhabits follows a series of rules, and those rules are fixed. And the reason is, as that first quotation suggests, is that this is part of the cultural language by which America unders understands itself, and that's really really important. So. Um, what we end up with is a, a question of conventions, and these conventions uh, underpin everything about the uh, the Western film. So uh, Cowelty, who writes another spectacular book on Westerns, su uh, suggests this is John G. Cowelty. He says, There are a great variety of situations and plots that can be made into Westerns, so long as the basic conventions of settings and character relations are maintained. Now, if we think about those settings and those character relations, we actually end up back into uh, the, the 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 reiteration of the importance of these kind of tropes. Um, you can do anything. You can make anything into some kind of Western or any kind of situation, any kind of urgency. Um, you can play around even with the tropes of the black hat and white hat or the duel or the kind of... Um, uh, the showdown between the sheriff and the people in the in the town, uh, as and the plot can be messed around with as long as it's the settings and the characters and their relationships that are maintained, and that is fascinating. So Cavelti says that this relationship is contingent entirely on um, the uh, relationship between good versus evil, and we've seen this before. It is all about the good versus evil, and only if the hero, i.e., the cowboy, uniquely and un complicatedly and unquestionably represents good. 
So everything, Cavalti argues, works towards a more complete and total identification with the hero. The villains, who are usually the Native Americans, although not always, uh, sometimes they're Mexicans or sometimes uh, they, they're, they are actually uh, white kind of villains, but most of the time it is more racist than anything else. The villains are clearly evil, the hero is morally pure, and the style invites our fullest and most unwitting participation in the hero's triumph over dis difficulties. And if anyone's familiar with the work of um, Peckinpah, for instance, when he's challenging that in the Wild Bunch, what you realize is he's doing is um, he's challenging that he's not challenging the the role or the set uh, sorry the uh, the plots or the situations of the um, the Western. What he's challenging is the belief, the infallible belief that the cowboy is right. So when we see that challenge and we see how powerful that challenge is, we realize that that total identification with the hero is massively important. Why? Because the Western form is about America establishing itself and its right to govern its own territories. So that's really what's happening when we think about the Western. When we think that the, that the uh, that it's the relationship between the characters and not necessarily the settings that's important, we actually come to a, a, another weird and bizarre conclusion, which is once again that kind of paradox that inheres within uh, the genre and uh, within genre theory, which is that the Western genre, which is one of the most categorical and unquestioned genres, is not rigid and fixed, but variant and changing. Rather than fixed taxonomies, a definition must reside in the common agreement among film filmmakers, audiences, and the institutions of cinema that brings them together, as David Lusted says. Thus, and this is my conclusion of Lusted, Western, perhaps more than any other genre, but, 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 but certainly any other genres, uh, but the Western in particular is a negotiated genre. That means it is one that is established by the relationships between the audiences, the filmmakers, and the institutions of cinema as a whole. So what we find out then is we see really, really quickly uh, that there is a code. There is a code that takes place, there is a code in action, and that all of these filmmakers are following those codes. And they're doing so in order to keep the same structural relations between the characters, even when they're varying the settings. So we can see this in action. We can see that code is, is, is in action from the very, very beginnings of certain films. So I'm going to play you two uh, very, very famous films. Uh, one is uh, Rio Grande from 1950, that's John Ford. And the second is uh, George Stevens' Shane from 1953. And I want you to look at the extent to which these films are uh, the same in their, um, in their opening scenes. So let's start off with the Rio Grande. So, so far, what we can see is a really important tension. Things are emerging here uh, from the right to the left and going towards the river. Here they can cross the river from the right to the left. And the river is very clearly acting as a kind of liminal space, as a border space between two territories. Uh, they are recognizably uh, US cavalry. I mean, if you've seen other uh, films, uh, you recognize them, sorry, as pioneers and of uh, US cavalry crossing this river. These are very recognizable. If you look in the background, what you can see is Monument Valley and Death Valley. Uh, and you can see that kind of slow pan movement and you can hear the violins uh, as they're kind of um, uh, probably overpowering my voice now because I can't actually hear the, uh, the score there. Uh, and the final thing that we notice is the, the font there. The font is, is classic Western. Uh, that, that kind of particular um, capitalized uh, and, and heavy serifed capital letters. It, you see it in wanted po no, posters and so on. Uh, and so what we're seeing is, is really worth mentioning again. We're seeing a right to left movement of pioneers going out into the unknown. Now, uh, let's look at the opening scene of Shell, which, uh, which comes from three years later. What we see is exactly the same plane. We see exactly, sorry, uh, what we're seeing is exactly the same plane. We're seeing almost the same kind of lettering. We've gone to color this time. Uh, but what we see is someone coming in from the left of the screen. You can probably just make them out in the middle of the screen, just behind the word Technicolor now. Left of the screen, towards the right, we see a uh, what we recognize as a cowboy. is certainly someone on horseback crossing the screen. We recognize a similar sort of territory, not quite the same Monument Valley, not quite the same bare, sparse desert, 
but nevertheless that kind of open plane is very clearly the, uh, the idea here. And we see probably some kind of river in the background leading on to some kind of mountains. This is recognizably American. And in front of those mountains, we see this kind of bucolic pictorial idyllic scene of the deer uh, drinking from the street steam stream and a classic log cabin farmstead. Now, this is an absolutely recognizable uh, farmstead here. Um, that Don't worry about the kid with the gun. It's fine. It, it all works out fine. Um, but those two opening scenes we can see follow absolutely the same kind of codes. Right. Uh, they're, as uh, David Luster says, they're not rig rigid and fixed, but varying and changing. But there is a common agreement uh, between those structural relations. Um, so when we see those uh, codes in actions, what we can start to bring uh, together from all of this is we start to recognize that the there is a structuralist approach. Right. Uh, I'm going to come back to specifics, the specifics of those two uh, clips in a moment. But what we can see is there is there is a structuralist approach between them. So. Um, if we go back to uh, our Will Wright Six Guns and Society, uh, we can see that structuralist approach uh, quite clearly. Uh, he lists them. This is uh, taken from his book Six Guns and Society. And we can see that he lists them as 60 in particular functions. And we can kind of, I'm not going to go through them in, uh, individually, don't worry. But we can kind of loosely group them as the first five will be separation. Uh, so a kind of a separation from society where the hero enters a social group, is unknown to society, is revealed to have an exceptional ability, and do, the society does not completely accept the hero. Then we see, if you'll remember your lecture from last week, you'll know that the next phase is an initiation. And we see this initiation where there's a conflict of interests, the villains are stronger than society, the villains threaten, and the hero remains aloof from the conflict, but is somehow learning about the conflict. And then 11 to 16 mark a return, wherein the villain the villains actually endanger a friend of the hero, and the hero intervenes, defeats, and restores peace to society. Now, if you've ever seen a, uh, a Western film, you, this is probably deeply familiar territory to you. You can probably actually replay anything from the remake of 310 to Yuma or uh, Broken Arrow, the... <coughs> Sorry, the Western, not the um, not the super weird uh, nuclear f the warhead film. Um, you can replay Unforgiven in your head or, or whatever. And you will find a true grit is another great, great example. You'll find exactly that process taking place where we have the en hero entering a social group, not quite uh, sort of wanting to get involved, but recognizing there is a problem, then intervening and fixing the problem. But when we actually look at the individual codes, we realize they're telling a story that is not quite so immediately obvious. What we realize they're actually telling us is a story about where that hero sits in society. And this is what Cavelti, John G. Cavelti, calls the Western Code. Um, so talking about uh, the Western Code, he says, what you always end up with in the Western is, first of all, a group of townspeople. That is, townspeople representing civilized society. And they are menaced by savages, those who, who represent an uncivilized society. And again, you have to be very aware that I'm using the term savage as a very outdated and very problematic term. But Cavelti says the savage symbolizes the violence, brutality and ignorance which civilized society seeks to control and eliminate. If you think of these not as specific kind of character functions, but as broader threats, what we're seeing is the history of the Western world from hunter gatherers with no particular kind of protection against the wilderness, no particular protection against anything other than each other. It's the actual civilization, it's the group of people together that ensures the survival. The threat comes from outside. So if the threat comes from outside, what do we need to stand in the middle? It needs to be the lone hero, which is the cowboy. And Cavalti points out, uh, sorry, no, this is me, points out this the lone cowboy. is He is neither us nor them, but sits outside society and protects them from chaos. Why? Because this, the uh, cowboy must use violence. And the irony is it's the violence that protects the society, but it's also that same violence that places him outside. So if you have the townspeople on the one side and you have the savages, again, it kills me every time I say that, the savages outside, the savages are threatening the town people with violence. That's what places them literally beyond the pale, if you know the etymology of that term, that's what it means. It means you're outside of the city walls. If you are violent, you have no place in civilized society. And this is basically what you hear old men saying at bus stops uh, up and down the country. Uh, violence has no place in a civilized society. So therefore, if you absolutely have to defeat violence with violence, then that violence must come from the lone hero who sits outside of society. This is why, now this is why I was saying pay really real attention to that um, 
uh, to that opening scene where we see both times with the first one we see the the group of people entering the river from one side and we see a threat coming from the other side in shane it's even more explicit that what we see is a question of home and domesticity we see that kind of log cabin um which is kind of the the the, the, the absolute marker of uh, U.S. domesticity. We see that cabin, uh, which is the domestic world, the townspeople, the civilized world, and we see the lone cowboy riding in from outside. That is absolutely critical because it's telling a really important story about how America sees its own founding and sees itself as somehow not morally or, or or culturally culpable for the violence that was enacted because it wasn't enacted by the civilized settled society it was enacted by people who operated entirely outside of it and that's kind of a really interesting cultural alibi and I, this is my theory is that this is why the western is so perennially popular among u.s audiences and if we look at this image we this incredibly well composed image i mean if you watch the the, the film shane you'll see that that child has actually got one of the most annoying voices in the history of cinema but actually that picture is beautifully constructed. Um, the man defending the, uh, the homestead uh, using that log cabin, which is heavily implied he's built himself. Everything looks rusted and rustic and homemade. Everything is about earning your living from the land and therefore protecting the land. And that, that rifle that sits, if you draw a line in the middle of the screen, in fact, just humor me, pause it right now and then take your ruler and draw a line in the middle of the screen, not actually with like, sharpie or anything but you know what i mean just find the center and you will see that that line that rifle is following exactly this the line of the screen uh, it's, it's also echoing the uh, the gate uh, just behind him you can see but and then shielded inside but also vulnerable is the woman all of them are blonde all of them are blue-eyed all of them are white-skinned and all of them are marking their territory quite literally marking that sense of belonging into the world so what we end up with here is a a, a genre of cinema that is all about dominating the landscape and all about dominating the discourse which marks it as their own territory. Any threat must come from outside. And if you start to think about it, what do we know happens with any cowboy uh, when they not only come from outside, but they leave? Where do they leave from? They leave from the civilized society and do they stay there? No, they ride off. And where do they ride off? And normally I, I like to ask people, but you know, you're exempted this year. Uh, uh, they ride off, obviously, into the sunset. Why do they ride off into the sunset? Where does the sunset in the West, right? What we're seeing is a story of America telling its own history, where civilization in this version of history, it's not the version of history, I need like a disclaimer at the bottom that says not real history, right? In this version of history, civilization comes from Europe. It's white, it's blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Scandinavian, Nordic, Europeans. They arrive on the East Coast. They civilize the East Coast and they move steadily West, right? As they're moving West, they're civilizing. Each home, each film, uh, Western film, where does it take place? On the frontier. The frontier between what? Have you ever asked yourself that? What's the frontier of? It's the frontier between civilized society and the wild, wild West. They're saying that the Native Americans who live in this West that is being permanently pushed further and further and further westwards, they are the uncivilized ones. They're the ones who need to be pushed out. What we see now is a massive unchecked imperial aggression. Uh, we see a process of of the marginalization, quite literally and geographically, geographical marginalization of a native group of people who who, who live and possess the land. Um, so then we see the, uh, the 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 theme and the motif emerging that going west is leaving civilization in the east and heading towards a lack of civilization in the west, and therefore suggesting that this cycle is iterative, that we will always need the lone cowboy to pursue that, um, uh, to, to, to subdue, sorry, uh, that wilderness in order to make it habitable and the home and domesticity will follow along. So we, this is why it's such a famous image to see the cowboy on top of his horse riding off into the sunset. It is, it's very deep, but it's working in your memory to make you realize that this person is heading towards the West. In fact, there are other aspects of the isolated and lone hero that perfectly uh, follow this same pattern that illustrate why it's so important. So uh, it suggests the classic construction of the cowboy is as follows, that the cowboy must be um, laconic. They must not speak very much because speech indicates civilization. If you've ever been, you know, in any kind of intimidating situation where someone doesn't speak, it is a question of power and speech. It kind of reveals uh, 
uh, your motivations and, and, and you diffuse a situation through talking. Uh, and so therefore speech is sin, uh, symptomatic of civilization and the fewer words they say, the more powerful they are. They are unquestionably masculine. There is no, uh, n the way of walking that was made, John Wayne made famous was a deeply hyper-masculine form of kind of man-spreading uh, and it's affected kind of everyone on the tube ever since but it is a a permanent iteration of uh, masculinity they are nomadic they must sleep anywhere where they can where they find some place to roll their mat and start a little campfire uh, because they can never settle down because the moment they settle down it means that america is conquered they are also deeply uh, tied to the horse and the horse is a massive important element of the cowboy part of that comes from the uh, the element of the horse within the uh, medieval literature where the horse was kind of a representation of warfare uh, and it still kind of is when we see that particularly with the US cavalry uh, I'm just going to mute for a second while I tell my dog to shut up Sorry about that. Uh, and then there's also a question of a direct tie to the freedom of, to explore the wilderness. The ability to explore and navigate and negotiate difficult terrain is entirely dependent on conquering the horse. Uh, and it's also a question about being pioneers and hence the sunset. They must also, and most obviously, be um, heroes who have total domination over their weapons. And the weapon is usually a six gun, hence Will Wright's six gun and society. It is usually a pistol that must be um, they must be the fastest draw in the West. If you've ever, you know, you've you've ever seen kind of the the classic duel, you'll know that the the most powerful person is the 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 one who's fastest on the draw. That mastery over the weapon is also a very subconscious but very deeply rooted element of talking about removing violence. Right. So, the further away you get from the violent or the violent act, the more civilized you are. So, just as the townsfolk don't enact any violence, therefore they are kind of. Um, unimpeachable uh, in terms of their actions so too the mastery over the weapon means that there are no kind of civilian casualties they don't sort of oops a mist and shoot the sheriff or you know some some kid walking past what they always do is they always shoot the villain accurately so the possession of their weapon is is really important it also shows mastery and therefore control and therefore it is controlled violence it is legitimized violence from that respect and finally it also removes you further and further away so you can have the rifle sitting you know the, when you see the, the rifle uh, uh, from a really far away, you're actually not enacting violence. It's nowhere near as brutal as, you know, standing right next to someone and, and hitting them with a tomahawk or hitting them with a stone or with your fists. So the closer you get into the target, the more uncivilized and brutal you are, the further away you're getting, the more kind of civilized you are because there's a technological object intervening in the space in between the two. Um, now we see this kind of question of domesticity and this rejection of violence in the actual framings of some of the most famous films. So uh, this here, this frame here is a very recognisable one from The Searchers of John Wayne right in the middle uh, and filmed on the porch of The Searchers. Now if you ever want to see the extent to which um, The Searchers does a very, very clever thing of placing the violence that is all... Uh, placed on the shoulders of John Wayne in the film, uh, placing the violence outside of domesticity, then all you need to do is watch the first 10 seconds and the last 10 seconds of The Searchers. So I can uh, show you the opening scene of The Searchers right now. So what we see is the door opening, the silhouetted woman coming out onto the porch, and looking out over the distance and seeing a dot on the horizon. Coming in from which direction? Oh yeah, that's the right. Okay, and this uh, apron is the symbol of domesticity. Uh, a bit more solidity in the brickwork and the wooden porch. Uh, this is definitely Monument Valley. Monument Valley was only uh, there because, um, there was only the, the Western because it was actually easy commuting distance from Los Angeles uh, as Hollywood was kind of uh, getting going. What are we seeing? We're seeing the family emerging from the house. There's only been a couple of, of takes so far, and you start to see, even, even the dogs come out to see what's going on. Uh, we start to see the arrival of a visitor, the dog barking to show it's a stranger and something difficult to understand, and we see the cowboy coming in. We're gonna cut, I think, to a low angle shot of the cowboy descending from the horse, and in a very masculine way, the, the women, uh, the, the, sorry, that's Uncle Ethan, they finally recognize him and it becomes brought into the fold. This is, this is like coming in from 
uh, from violence and from ostracism uh, and in towards society. You can see that framing as he, he's framed within the door of the, um, of the house uh, and his slow kind of acceptance as he's invited in. Right now, if we compare that with the, the final scene of uh, The Searchers, which it takes a little while to get there, um, but this is them coming in. You can see the extent to which this is completely a shot-by-shot -shot reversal of that opening scene, but the cameras move to the other end of the porch. It's a really, really eagle-eyed viewer who would spot that. But the cameras move to the other side of the porch, and we're, we're seeing a replay of precisely that camera. Of that same cinematography, we're seeing Death Valley again. We're seeing that the uh, the time of day is slightly different, but now we see the center of the frame of the horse arriving. We see that same family leaving the steps, leaving that kind of sheltered refuge of domesticity. We see the dismount, and we see those same girl. Well, we see the same little girl being brought back in from outside of domesticity and returned to the domestic sphere. That's, of course, a massive spoiler um, for you, but I'm, I'm going to assume you've seen the searches, and if you haven't, you should. That's amazing. Uh, right, you see him be, have been placed. She doesn't set foot on the sand. She's been put down by Ethan uh, and being brought back inside to the fold. This is an absolute symbolism, uh, a very clear symbolism of John for bringing the, uh, the lost child, the civilized savage, back into the fold. And if you do watch this, the search is the surprise that you see, which is really important, is why that is so symbolic. Now, all of the family finally returning inside, dusting off the hat. We see John Wayne about to enter in through the porch. Of course, what does he have to do? He's an act of the violence. He's tainted himself from society. He must remove himself, therefore, from society. As he walks away, what does John Wayne do? The most classic ending, where remember we saw the film beginning with the opening door? and the end. So what we see are those codes being played with as a really important fundamental element of the Western, of a way of telling not just a story about a specific person, but about who they were and where they were going. So to finish this section on the Western, uh, we can also see that Western spilling over into other genres. We see it spilling over into the gangster uh, genre. And you may not think that the gangster is completely connected, but think about the question of violence and violence existing outside society and there being no place for violence in society. And we can see that the Western is basically at the same kind of film as a wholesale transition from the rural to the urban. So the gangster's desperate need to prove himself uh, drives him from one bout of activity to the other. The Western is self-contained, but they represent both a kind of individualism uh, that kind of gets lost in the city. This is Pam Cook's argument. Um, we also see the Western translating after World War II into the war film. Um, so the war film, the hero becomes a gunfighter who more often than not could no longer be reintegrated into society. And this is uh, absolutely the case that we see with the post-traumatic stress cycle um, of Vietnam films in particular, uh, where we see, you know, Jacob's Ladder is the most famous one. But we also see that quite clearly with Deer Hunter, um, with uh, Apocalypse Now. Um, in some ways, it is very heavily intimated. And of course, with Platoon, the set film for this week. Um, so... All of that brings us then to the conclusions, um, which is uh, how do those genre films fit into their social context? So as I'm running uh, up to the to the limit, I don't propose to go through massive, uh, massively in depth uh, what those mean, but I will actually think a little bit about um, the uh, the role of the genre movie uh, in that the uh, the themes are, are, are important. So we think about genre movies. Uh, A.O. Scott writes in 2008 that the westerns were obsessed with similar themes, but to find ambiguities and tensions buried within their paradigms. And this is returning back to the really important question I posed at the beginning of this lecture, where I said what you've got is a question of a formula that is repeated over and over again. But how do audiences not get bored? And it's that ambiguity and that tension which is buried within the rigid paradigm. What that means means then is if we ask the question about whether genre films are formulaic then the answer is quite clearly yes they are they rely on pre-established conventions they announce their own setting within the genre and we've seen you know with uh, the with Shane with the searchers and with Rio, Bra Rio Grande and Rio Bravo and Stagecoach and even the Tarantino cycle of westerns and we'll talk about Django in a later um, lecture well we see that they kind of announce their setting through those codes which are instantly recognizable and they abide by the rules of the game they're closely associated associated with the same stars and the same auteurs. Right, sure. But also, no. Um, they are not formulaic because they depend on their very ability to change. And it's the ability to change and develop in response to different needs of audiences that keeps them popular. The conventions are fixed, 
but the forms are fluid uh, and the cycles will come and go and it's more important not just what they're doing but their relationship with the contemporary context. So I want us to think about this because when I suggested that the uh, Western films become kind of merge and segue into the genre film, into the war film, uh, this is exactly why I chose Platoon as the set film for this week, because it illustrates almost exactly the same kinds of uh, ideas that existed within the Western, only with one major difference, and that is that they are in reverse. So um, if we watch the, the clip for Platoon, what we see is the separation element of we see him disappearing off into the jungle. We see him riding over the jungle, an indistinguishable mass, leaving, and he actually was, was walking from the right to the left there, through an unknown terrain. Through that unknown terrain, he doesn't meet these savages. These savages exist as merged within that terrain and cannot be seen. What we see is that cavalry moving through this unknown and unnavigable terrain, which further removes them from society. Uh, we see them climbing up uh, obstacles. We need, at some point, we need some kind of helper, some kind of mythical, mystical helper who's going to help out the hero. And we need some kind of a call to adventure here. The call to adventure is actually backwards. It's been taken uh, from us. But what we see is um, the struggle here. Uh, as they climb up the hill, they're penetrating further and further into the forest, and each step that they take takes them further away from where they should be. There's one falling backwards who can't take the new terrain. Uh, and we see this wide-eyed innocence. We see new villains and new villainous threats, uh, and so on. And here we see the helper, uh, who is comfortable at ease, who has mastery over his weapon. Uh, the horses become helicopters, and that's something that's very, very clearly uh, taken care of in um, Apocalypse Now, where the cavalry regiment uh, then take over the helicopter, or the helicopter regiment, the airborne. Uh, it's very clearly uh, mentioned that they used to be the cavalry, and they're also uh, from the Deep South, so there's that kind of North-South uh, problem throughout the film. So when we see them disappearing away into uh okay fine uh barnes moved from left to right there that that kind of destroys my theory but what we're seeing is a, a separation uh, from society and um platoon is all about resisting that ability to return uh, and so when we see that kind of approach taking place that's what i would like to think about uh, in some of the seminars um, you'll see that in, um, in in the seminar worksheet. I'm actually talking specifically about the extent to which Platoon works on some of those same tropes, but about the inability for for America to establish itself within Vietnam. And that fundamental failure, uh, I'm suggesting, is because of the familiarity of uh, the codes of the Western. Um, and so finally then, the reason that that would be the case is because genre films offer solutions to problems, right? The genre films address contemporary conflicts. They're never about the past. They're about the present. And they resolve them in a simplistic and reactionary way. They never deal present directly with the present. So that's why the, the Western becomes really popular at specific moments in the 20th century. So we, we can talk about those in the seminars. But specific moments in the 20th century when America comes to doubt its own ability to rule the world or its own kind of logical position uh, as, as hegemonic superpower, it then starts to tell its own stories about itself. So if you see the failure of the war on terror, for instance, in the beginning of the 21st century, where do they turn? They turn back to that familiar, comfortable grooves of the Western film. So I'm going to leave that one here. If you have any questions, as always, please do just email me. Um, I think Paul will be taking the seminars online with you. Um, I really hope you enjoy the discussions in there. I'm sure you'll have some lively discussions. Um, and in uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy the set reading as well, which is Booker's Quest theme. I've also put on Blackboard some um, handouts which show how Platoon works in exactly the same way as Booker's Quest themes and exactly the same way as Prop and exactly the same way as Todorov. So uh, have a look at those and you'll see what I'm saying, that these are very, very rigid conventions, but what changes is the, 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 the specific nuance of each one. Thanks for your attention uh, and I look forward to talking to you again later on in the semester.